Neil Before Blog presents Neil Before Pod. Hello, and welcome to the Neil Before Pod interview segment. I'm your host, Craig, and recently I had the chance to talk to director Mary Lou Belli, who has worked on massive shows like NCIS New Orleans and Black Lightning. She had some fascinating insight into her career, directing superhero action, and much, much more. Enjoy. I'm delighted to be joined on Neil Before Pod with Mary Lou Belli, director of episodes of Black Lightning, among many other things. Hello, how are you doing? Oh, I'm great, Craig. So happy to be here with you today. I'm glad to have you on. It's great to get a chat about the background of certain shows. So thanks for giving up your time and coming on to chat and letting the audience hear. I love what I do and anything I can help to get more eyes on it. And especially with an audience who, who want to explore new shows or just more interested in shows are already watching. I'm all for that. Cool. So let's just start with a bit of your formative years in this career. So how is it you got into directing in the first place? What made you pursue that dream? I actually was working on a situation comedy, a sitcom. It was one of the first shows I had in Los Angeles, having had an acting career um, in New York. And someone on the show who saw me coaching said, you're a director. And I immediately argued with him. (laughs) But I have to say, what he said to me kind of put a little seed in the back of my mind. And I'd only taken one directing class at the university level. And I was very, very young. I even graduated from my university. It usually is a four-year program. And I had done it with gobs of extra credits in three years, mainly so I could get to New York City and start my acting career. But the one directing class I had, I think it was just a lack of a point of view about the world because I was still so very, very young. But a lot of things happened to me in that first year, having graduated from college and being in New York City, whether it was love affairs I had, my roommate's mom passed away, our apartment was burglarized twice, someone had died in my lap on a New York City bus. There were like life things that happened that kind of jolt you into growing up and forming a point of view. And I think that's such an essential thing as a director, so that when this man, Jack Riley, who was a very, very famous sitcom actor already at that time, said this to me, I thought about it. And I immediately went to my theater company where I was acting and said, you know, I want to expand this thing I do. I know so much about acting and I love it so much, but I really want to try this directing thing. So I tried it in the safety of the theater. And then I asked to observe the directors on the show where I was coaching. And I had so many generous mentors who did this for me or allowed me to do it with them. And I learned the other half of the job, which is about, you know, learning cameras and how to tell the story visually. And I already, my my theater work, I knew how to stage. And I obviously knew how to work with actors. So it sort of came together as a nice package. And I was directing before I was 30 years old on network television. And it was a big deal then because there were very few women doing it. It does seem to be growing in that sense with more women coming into prominence. I see that a lot in the CW with a lot of women directors, actually. I mean, you... CW is extremely good. Fox has been good. The Directors Guild has followed the stats on how many people. And last year, the last set of data that they put out, it was formidable how much it had changed in, let's say, six or seven years. And we just hope we can do the same in future films, which is still quite lacking in terms of participation of women directors and the stories they tell that go along with that. Yeah, it's kind of a long road, but we will get there sort of idea. Yeah. And your work has mainly been in TV. Looking at your IMDb page, you've done a lot on TV or TV films. Is that just the way it's worked out? Is there plans to try and break into film and things like that? Yeah, I have a couple projects. If someone said we have this budget for a film, but I love the medium of television. I love going from show to show to show. I love how fast it is. I love, most of all, the quality of the writing, because I think we're definitely in, they used to talk about the golden age of television. Well, we're in a new golden age. And I think the stories that are being told on television are the most vibrant storytelling. And I compare it to features and say, 
we're miles ahead, especially when you tap not just the long-running multi-season television show, but when you look at the limited series, you can say, oh, I only need three episodes, which is only 40 minutes longer than a full-length feature, to tell this entire story, and I can tell it well. I think we're looking at the way people view things now and say, look at the story and what's the best way to tell it. So we're honoring the story now and not just how it's released and distributed. And television has a potent international platform now. Yeah, for sure. And is there a favorite genre you like to direct or do you, are you happy just going from different things and, and playing around in different fields? Well, I love going thing to thing. And I have to tell you, there is a little bit of pigeonholing. So if you're doing one genre, they think this is the only thing you can do. And after doing over 100 episodes of sitcoms, I really wanted to break out into drama. And I had to basically not even take interviews for situation comedies to be taken seriously and become known as what I am now, as people think of me as an action director. And it was only this season that I went back and did a multi-camera. I did four episodes of a multi-camera comedy earlier this year in 2021. And it was because I'm so well established now as a action director that it wasn't going to hurt my reputation. And my representative said, hey, there's a sitcom. Do you want to look at it? And I loved it. And it was so much fun to A, put those very, very comfortable bedroom slippers on again, because it's something I can do with my eyes closed. And it's very different from directing action. You rehearse more, you play more. The tone on set is different when you're doing a sitcom than when you're doing people dying or exploding or (laughs) (laughs) murder and mayhem. But I think if I had to say I have a favorite, it's character-driven drama where the acting and the depth of character supports the storyline. And then if you throw in a couple car chases or explosions, it's right up my alley for my favorite thing to do. And then you said it, I do love the diversity. I started the season with a, a Disney Channel suspense thriller time travel piece. I jumped into a superhero show for my second season on Black Lightning Then I went to four episodes of a sitcom. Then I just finished the penultimate episode of NCIS New Orleans, a show I've been doing for, I think this was my sixth season with them. And I next go to a very, very glossy, very, very rich, very, very music industry in Los Angeles. And I want to say soap opera, but a drama that has a lot of intrigue and crime in it. And then I finish up with a very, very homey, small town show for Netflix. So the fact that I get to do all of that in the span of eight months or nine months is pretty amazing. And if variety is the spice of life, I guess I like it spicy. (laughs) Yeah, well, it keeps things interesting, doesn't it? You're never stuck on one particular project for too long by the sounds of things, which must, must be great for honing your craft. Yeah, yeah. And at the same time, I've been researching for the last three days a meeting I have for something that's a period drama, which I would love to do something with lots of costumes and wigs. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, cool. You mentioned NCIS, New Orleans and Black Lightning as well. Those shows are kind of known, well, maybe not known, but they do have a bit of a house style, whereas every episode is on brand for itself. What's that like coming in as a director to make sure it matches up, but also putting your own stamp we liken it to you've been asked to deliver a pizza, but you can try to choose your own toppings. But you have to make sure that you're not delivering a pasta dinner or a fried chicken dinner. You're delivering the pizza. They want the pizza. And then you just get to make sure it's the most delicious pizza they've ever tasted. And again, you can add your own little grace notes, whatever to it. I love the form. I am a person who loves figuring out puzzles. And it was really the secret to me realizing I didn't want to be an actress slash singer slash dancer anymore because performing was not my favorite thing about being an actor. What I liked was rehearsing. So once I figured out the puzzle, I remember being in a show and I was doing my hundredth performance of a show. And I thought, 
this is not what makes me happy. I don't want to do the same show every night and twice on Wednesdays and Saturdays. (laughs) I want to try something new. So rehearsing and figuring out the puzzle is the secret to episodic television. So you're basically looking at what is this series? How does it look? And one of the tricks of the trade of really studying the visual style of a show is to watch it with the sound off. And sometimes you are looking at prototypes where they go, we want it to look like this movie or this other TV series, or we want to create something new in terms of the look, the color wise, is it saturated? Is it not saturated? And then I kind of go, oh, that's this. So half the joy for me is identifying what it is, fitting my the particular story or episode into those parameters, and then being able to put my own stamp on it. And it's interesting because although I've written four books, I've only written one full-length screenplay and a couple of shorts. But when I went to write my full-length screenplay, the natural fit for me was not to come up with my own story, but to, to adapt a book. So I don't like finding the germ of something and creating it. I always like being able to identify something that's good and add to it. And part of that is, you know, just growing up and knowing what you like and where your skill set lends itself. Yeah, cool. And well, I remember when Kevin Smith first directed an episode of The Flash and he was doing video logs about it, as he does, he always talks about everything. And he talked about how the production team When he came on to direct, they had been making the show for a long time and they knew exactly what they were doing, how to put things together very quickly. Is that your experience as well? Is that a resource you use when coming on to something like Black Lightning? It really is a team effort. In fact, I just posted something on Facebook yesterday or two days ago. I had just turned in an episode of NCS New Orleans and there's, I don't think I'm giving this away, there's a chase scene in this particular episode. And I was just extolling the talents of my second unit, my second unit director, the person who was a director of photography, the ADs, the visual effects people, the special effects people, the people who were using the drones, the people who were using the cranes. You come into a show that is already on the move and you have to literally jump on a moving train. I find that exhilarating. Some of the work in terms of pre-scouting locations has already been done for you so that you're basically just cherry picking exactly what you want. I love the idea of joining a team. And then if you're blessed to have, because some of the most important people at the very beginning are the people who are helping you cast, your casting team, and most importantly, your production design team, who are making sure that the show keeps looking the same as it has for the life of the series but also helping you find locations. And if they're designing sets, for instance, I was in a set for my last episode that I just turned in, in a set that I have directed many, many, many scenes in before. But in this particular sequence, there was a slight change in every scene because of the storyline. And that was fun to see it develop visually. So not one scene in there has the same backgrounds because it has this subtle shift from beginning of episode to the end of the episode. When you have the gift of a great production designer, as I do in the person of Victoria Paul on NCIS New Orleans, or the talented Jay Vetter on Black Lightning, you just go, wow, they're creating wonderful places for me to play and put my actors. So it does make a difference. And when it comes to you get given the scripts for an episode of TV, how is that assigned? Do they contact you because they think you'll be great at a particular episode in the season? Or do you express interest in a specific episode or specific episodes? That's not how it works. In the US, and I think this is a little different from the UK and Ireland, where I've had experience talking to people in the television business, not all the episodes are written before we start here. In a lot of European shows, every episode is written before you start filming the series. So things are still in the, we're writing it now. And directors usually don't get a say on which episode. On NCIS New Orleans, 
they almost always brought me in for the third or fourth episode. And then again, later in the season for one of the last every season on Black Lightning. I think I did 304 in season three and 404 and 406 in season four. So sometimes it's about scheduling directors, especially those of us who hop from show to show to show. So you just get the one that's in the dates that work for you. The only exception I will say is the former chair of NBC, Robert Greenblatt, who was at Showtime before that. Bob used to say, if it's a musical episode, we're going to give it to Mary Lou, only because he happens to be a, a wonderful musician himself. And he recognizes someone who has a musical background and the difference it does make because I came from musical theater and I was trained as a singer and a dancer. When you put something that's complex music wise into the hands of a musician, it does make a difference. So he would always say, let's make sure if we have a musical episode this season, Mary Lou gets it. So it's a bit of both really. Sometimes there is specific episodes that suit you more than others or whatever. But sometimes, as you say, you just get given, here's the script for episode four or whatever. I would say 80% of the time, it's the luck of the draw. So when you get that script, obviously it's your job to look through it and find out where the biggest meaty moments is to plan. Can that be difficult when you have no real concept of what the material will be before you go in? Well, the secret is being able to analyze it quickly. I think by my director's guild contract, they only have to give me the episode I'm starting the night before. Oh, wow. Sometimes they don't even adhere to those rules. But for the most part, for me to get an episode a week before I start is a huge luxury. So I have to come in knowing the show, knowing what the show looks like, knowing the skill set of the actors I'll be working with who are in the series regular cast, and then jump in and look at the formula of the show and see how the pieces fit. And I do something that's described in the third book I wrote with Bethany Rooney, Um, which is a concept of hers that she contributed to the book. And I would say when people read this kind of a handbook for directing television, they remark about this more than anything else. And she has what she calls the director's diagram. And it's about breaking down the script into beats and storylines. And if I know the show well, I can usually do it in about two and a half hours, but I can basically go, I understand the script. I can go do all the work and take all the meetings based on my first read and then my two and a half hour analysis doing my director's diagram. Oh, really fast work then. It is very fast, but I also love that about it. Again, it's like that moving train. If you don't like moving trains, you shouldn't be in television. (laughs) (laughs) And it will be that, won't it? It's the episodic television where they have to meet the airing schedule, they have to meet the exactly filming schedule. It might, must be quite a challenge, but I imagine it's quite rewarding once you're in flow and you're just in the zone, just plowing through it. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a great ride. And with this whole messy COVID situation that we're in at the moment, how has that impacted the work of directing in your experience? Before we went back to work, I was very much on top of, because some of my friends were huge influences and huge people in the movement to get our industry back on track and to say, we can do this, we can do it safely, and we are going to prove it. I think the first people that did in the US was the professional basketball leagues said, we're going to do this. We're going to air basketball games and we're going to stay safe while doing it. And then Steven Soderbergh, Paris Barkley were probably the huge leaders in our industry, Paris Barkley being a former president of the Directors Guild and Steven Soderbergh being the famous film director he is. But they were at the movement that brought three or four unions together to say, what are the protocols? So before any of us went back to work, we were reading a 40-page document that everyone in our industry agreed on. Although there's little variations, because I've now worked for four different companies and I'm about to go to my fifth since COVID. And they all have slightly different things they do, but I've been tested three times to four times a week. I get tested before I get on a plane. I get tested as soon as I get off a plane. I do Zoom meetings rather than in-person meetings. I sometimes am looking at a set through photos as opposed to visiting it and taking my own pictures while I'm there. And then I'm wearing a mask. I'm wearing a shield. 
In some cases, I'm wearing PPE garments from head to toe, including booties and a bonnet. And we're keeping people safe. And we are making television shows where everyone feels, especially those who are the actors and work without masks on while the camera is rolling during rehearsals, they have their masks on, that we're all doing what it costs, doing what needs to be done to make it safe, and also being very cognizant of how much more this is costing the industry so that we are trying to be as efficient, even more efficient than possible, and for the health of it all, trying to work shorter hours in general. I'd say it's paying off, certainly on Black Lightning. I haven't really noticed any difference between pre-COVID film Black Lightning and post-COVID film Black Lightning. It looks the same. The potential limitations don't seem to be there on screen, so I think that certainly works. I think you're absolutely right, and I would say that's the case on almost every show I've been on, where we haven't sacrificed quality But I will tell you, it's costing the people who are producing it more. Yeah, I can imagine. So I imagine it's not easy to keep it all running with all that to bear in mind. I mean, I imagine it's hard enough at the best of times, but with all this, really impressed with the ability to put together a show of that calibre with everything else to bear in mind on the back of it. So that's really good. And I have to say, I've worked with two directors of photography on that particular show, Fernando and Anna, and they both are super good storytellers and have an extraordinary visual sense, which I think kind of makes Black Lightning stand out, not just because it's another superhero show, but because it's a superhero show with a huge amount of visual style to it. Yeah, definitely. It stands apart from the other Arrowverse shows in that sense. It's very distinct in the way that it's structured and the way that it looks and everything else. So. Yeah, definitely agree with you there. In terms of your directing style, what's your general approach? Do you spend more time with the actors? Do you think more on how the scene is going to look or play out? What's your biggest focus? The whole package has to be there to be considered a good director. I said I'm an action director, but I'm basically known in the business as an actor's director. So I get a lot of my jobs because I get requested by actors who like working with me. And I think part of that skill set came from having been an actor myself and being very, very in tune to the process and creating a safe space for actors to do their work. So I'm not dictatorial. I am very collaborative. I come in always with a plan, but very open to hear other people's ideas, especially if actors have thought long and hard about it. and discovering something new, especially with their contribution. Especially in a long-running show like Black Lightning, the actors will know their characters inside out as well. So that'll be a good resource. But at the same time, letting them play and knowing, especially when you're coming back to a show for multiple seasons, every actor is different. And there's a saying, every actor needs a different director. And you have to be all of those directors. (laughs) (laughs) So you have to be all things to all people. And that goes along with your crew and your department heads too. I interact differently with certain production designers than I do with others. So it's about getting the job done. But I would say I'm known mostly as an actor's director. And on TV, that's important. Certainly on something like Black Lightning, there's a lot of intense moments that characters share. So it's all about getting that performance, isn't it? To sell those moments. And also, from a very, very practical point of view about getting your second job, the actors who are the leads on the show wield an enormous amount of power. And if they don't like you or the way you collaborate with them in the actor-director circle of influence, you don't get asked back. You get asked back because the actors like you and want to work again with you. Cool. And one thing I definitely needed to ask was for NCI's New Orleans, you've got Scott Bakula and I'm a huge Star Trek fan and loved Quantum Leap. So what was it like working with him and directing him? I can imagine that he's great to be around. He is one of my favorite, favorite people to direct. He always has ideas. He loves for a scene to be a dynamic because he has directed himself. He's very conscious of things that are good for production, but at the same time, he honors the story so much so that Scott has made me a better director just by trying to put myself into his character's shoes, because I know that if he's playing an NCIS officer, 
he wants to never do something procedurally that makes the Navy or federal agents not look authentic. So authenticity is so important to him, down to the way he studies his script in terms of the accent he's using or the dialect he's using. He's very thorough. He's very creative. He's very collaborative. I cannot say enough good things about him. He's a joy to work with. And his attention to detail and wanting the best for the show is amazing. But on top of that, I don't know if you have the same term in the UK, but we talk about number one on the call sheet, the person who is the lead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically, the attitude of everybody trickles down from their work ethic. And Scott's work ethic is exemplary. So everybody who emulates and follows his lead contributes the same way he does to the show. So it's really lovely. It's a great anecdote. I just, I do like the guy a lot. I've seen him talk at Star Trek conventions, but I've never actually met him. But he does seem like he just really knows his stuff and really loves what he does as well, which must be great to work with and work for and all that. He is. So on Black Lightning, you've directed two episodes this season that have aired and then a third that's coming up the backdoor pilot one which i definitely want to ask about i actually didn't do the backdoor pilot all right that was okay. directed by the person who created the show salim akil all right okay imdb is wrong then that needs changed <laughs> i'm very excited about we call it 407 and i think it's airing on april 12th i cannot wait especially because The boy who is the main character in that, Jordan Calloway, who plays Painkiller, he's an extraordinary young man, extraordinarily talented. You know how I said a person who is number one on the call sheet and jumps into that leadership role with good examples and hard work ethic? There's sometimes people who get opportunities because of who they are, who they know, and then there's some people who get it because of the amazing amount of hard work they have done and they deserve it. Jordan Calloway is in that latter group. He absolutely deserves it. And I hope everybody watches that next episode of Black Lightning that will air. Yeah, I hope the spinoff gets picked up as well because I've always enjoyed his contribution on the show in previous seasons. So I'd really like to see that get taken forward. Yes. Backdoor pilots are always an interesting thing in television as well. This sub-episode within a season that sets up a show that might never exist in a lot of ways. I think with this one, it's slightly different because it's a character that was introduced in the show rather than trying to introduce some kind of offshoot concept that can be picked up in a show of its own. So it's something that really interests me and I really do hope it gets picked up and looking forward to seeing that episode in a couple of weeks as of the time of recording. Yeah. So the two episodes you've done so far this season, what's the vibe been like on set with it being the final season? Is there a degree of finality to everything? I came in after the announcement had been made. To be frank, I was glad I wasn't there the day it was announced because there's always a sadness, especially when it's a family. And by fourth season, you're a family. These are people who you can't wait to get back and work with again. And you know that you're spending seven, to eight months a year with these same people. And when it's a joy to go to work and work with them for four years in a row, it's a gift. So when you know that that family might not be moving forward, it's bittersweet. It's very bittersweet. So when I came in to do the two episodes I directed, they already knew. And they also already knew that 407 was going to be a backdoor pilot. So I think everybody's good wishes and contribution was not only to make sure that every episode was good this season, but to also one of the first directors on stage I ever worked with as an actor, his name was Garland Wright. And Garland used to say, when you leave the stage, after you make an exit, throw the energy back onto the stage so that the characters that Celine, with the help of the original Black Lightning comic, that Celine's characters were going to live on and create another world for Painkiller or expand the world that Painkiller came from into one that would hopefully have another four to six years or as many as if Painkiller goes, if it becomes 
a successful series in and of itself. So you introduced the new Jennifer as well, which, or did, well, did. Did, your episode didn't introduce, but it was the first episode that she featured prominently and it was a previous episode yes. where she was actually introduced. So what was that like just bringing in a new cast member to play an existing character? And you'd worked with the original actor, of course, as well. So Yes, and I loved working with China. But it was interesting. I looked at her work and there wasn't that much. I don't know that she even had an extensive IMDb page if any, because she literally had just graduated from school. So the few things I got to see of her work before I met her in person was auditions she had done in videotape. I literally kind of jumped in and figured out that A, she was super talented. B, she was going to work her butt off. That even though she was new to television, she wasn't afraid. She didn't come with any fear. And here was the best thing that happened. The generosity of all the actors who got to work with her and give her little tips. I will tell you particularly, James Remar was, which he is so much a a father figure on that show to so many people in terms of mentoring them and showing them how to work as a film or television actor. He comes with a huge, huge history. I had known his work from films and especially Sex and the City, which I had seen him on. But it was such an honor to work with him, but to also see how generous he was with her. And it was the same way as he was generous with China. But he also knew he was working with someone who was pretty green, but respected the huge amount of talent. He mentored her from the moment he stepped on the same stage and was in the same scene with her, as did many, 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 many of the other actors who worked with her. It was lovely to see. And she just blossomed. She blossomed under the love she felt and the protection she felt and the excitement that everybody had for her introducing this new version of Jen. And that reflected through in the dynamic that she managed to create with all of the characters, because obviously it was the first time they were in scenes with that Jennifer, but it all seemed very, very natural in that particular episode. I thought it was really well done. And that'll be a testament to the work you did with the actors as well. Well, thank you. But the actors were extraordinary. The first sister scene I directed, and I directed sister scenes before, but this was a new sister. And they found their rhythm. They found how much they loved each other. Their dynamic and chemistry was immediately apparent, as was the mother-daughter. I mean, there was everything. The father-daughter relationship, the mother-daughter relationship, the sister relationship, the Uncle Gamby relationship, they all added to the three-dimensional character that she was able to bring in her version of Jen. And then getting her involved in an action scene as well, that would have been an (laughs) interesting first, wouldn't it? Yeah, and just explaining how things like that work. Unless, (laughs) my son's an actor, unless you've played Peter Pan (laughs) or one of the darling children, you don't fly around a lot in the theatre. So I'd asked her if she had, and I don't think she had worn a harness before. She has work where she's literally in a harness with nothing under her feet. So you just have the opportunity to introduce them to new things. In my, and I can say this, I think, long career, when you've worked with someone who has a comfort zone in another area, if you can relate the similarities, like for instance, I've directed a number of basketball players from Dennis Rodman to Meta World Peace to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. I've directed or coached people like Johnny Cochran, the lawyer. I've coached prima ballerinas. So if you can take the field with which they are comfortable and then relate the skill set to it's the same as this, but it's only this, then it's an easier transference of skills. She had a lot of experience on stage already, especially from her university. I think she came from University of Michigan. So you can just say, this is just like this, and they can thrive. So they're not going into a completely foreign country. It's just a foreign country where they have to adapt the language they already know, but with a little different dialect. The action sequences that do use a lot of CGI and things. What is that like when actually filming it? Obviously, you have to use your imagination with, and then lightning comes out of his hand or electricity comes out of his hand and things like that. So what's that like sort of shooting it and preparing for that and and trying to visualise how it's going to end up? Sometimes if it's a completely new thing and we already have 
preliminary drawings of what the visuals will look like, I will often share them with the actors to say, you don't have to imagine what this looks like. I'm just going to show you a drawing of it or a rendering of it. With something as simple as lightning, for instance, was shooting bolts of lightning out of his hands for four seasons. So he knows exactly what that looks like. And then she observed how he did it and her version of how she was going to take down villains was the same for her. She just copied what other people were doing or found her way. And I'm sure she had studied all the episodes before her. And she was told very clearly not to try to do an imitation of the original Jen. Yeah, it has to be her own stamp, otherwise it won't work. The recast wouldn't work at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What lent itself to that is she looked different. She looked very, very different from China. So they weren't saying we're trying to cast a twin. We're casting you with the way you look, which is different from her, so that you can bring your own take on this character, especially having gone through basically a reconstruction in space of her molecules to come back through Uncle Gamby's scientific wisdom and part of her mom's. Yeah, it must be quite something seeing a lot of that techno babble just fired out from these actors because there's a lot of scientific jargon and comic book jargon that comes out in these shows just because of what they are. Yeah. But also, if you talk to Christopher, who plays TC, he was playing someone who was brilliant scientifically, but also who isolated and came from huge and difficult background as a kid. So the amount of work that Christopher put into it to study what does a kid who's damaged from his early childhood look like? And then he builds on that. So in so many cases, it's also the background work that an actor does when they come to the role. And for instance, Christine Adams, she wants to look professional. She's touching scientific equipment every day in every scene. And she doesn't want to look foolish, just like Scott Bakula wants to be a credible federal agent. Christine wants to be a credible scientist and doctor. So there's a certain pride that goes into doing that well and whatever it takes to look professional and master the jargon that goes with it. So it comes trippingly off the tongue, so to speak, when they say the words. Yeah. I wanted to ask a bit about scenes with Tobias because... In the show, he's a very, very intimidating guy. And I've seen behind the scenes stuff where he's not that in real life. You know, what's it like just seeing that transformation in him as he gets into character? He wasn't in the first episode, the first season I worked with, but I got to meet him on stage and we chatted a bit. And it was one of the great sadnesses of my first season that he wasn't in that first episode I directed. So I was so thrilled to find out that he played a huge part in the next two I was going to do. He is so lovely. I love this man so much. He is elegant. He is kind. He is thoughtful. He takes his job as an actor so seriously because he's so well known in his other field as a musician. So it's lovely to see him want to bring the excellence he already knows in that industry to the television industry. I cannot say, I mean, if you could see me right now, I am smiling ear to ear just thinking about him because (laughs) I love him so much. And I love to watch him in the scenes, but in one of the episodes you directed, the scene you had with Jefferson, where it was just about the, I'm going to take you down from Tobias' point of view. I think that's really great stuff, really intense stuff. Was that the restaurant, the restaurant scene? Oh, wasn't that amazing? Yeah, it was great. And, you know, it's so nice to see someone, especially plays a villain, not go for that cliche villain. He finds so many colors where you think there might be a sinister edge. He finds a sense of humor and enjoys manipulating people as the character. I love how many colors he brings to everything he does. And you got the sort of reconciliation between Jeff and Lynn as well. Kind of had a lot to work through still, but you had that, which was a really sweet scene where they just finally opened up to each other after the four episodes, three, four episodes of not doing that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, Just so much variety. And they love each other as well as they fight each other. So it's nice to have both in the two episodes I directed. Yeah. Because they can go at each other and it can be painful to watch because it feels so real. 
but also when they're fighting for their daughter or for their relationship, any relationship goes through ups and downs. And in this case, looking at addiction that both of them are dealing with, it's lovely to see them support each other. The going gets tough, the tough gets going. But I also feel that you know someone well and know what their true stripes are when you go through a crisis together. Yeah, and the show does handle a lot of those really relevant, really difficult themes as well with addiction or with race issues, things like that. So I imagine being behind the camera and getting to explore those issues in the way that you put the story together is really rewarding as well, because Black Lightning is such a textured and layered show, I think, in terms of bringing those things forward. And the way they've done with Anissa, with her marriage this season and and other things that she does, I think that's just great stuff. The way that everything just kind of weaves in and they're not afraid to tackle the big questions. And I have to tell you, as a director, you feel a responsibility to bring honour to the stories you get to tell. Like, for instance, there was a Brianna Taylor, I don't know if you want to say it, homage or tribute, but something that brought to light the painful and wrongful death that a real life American went through and then echoed in a story we were telling in a superhero show. Yeah. You just want to get it right. There's a responsibility of got to get this one right. I would definitely say you did. So very well, well done. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. Very welcome. In terms of the action in it, of the episodes you've directed, do you have a particular favourite set piece that you got to be involved in? Yeah, I will tell you, there was one that we introduced the martial artist. League of Assassins guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, that was a particularly beautifully choreographed sequence. And we filmed it on a very, very, very tough, really cold, rainy day. First, one gang kills four assistance. And then it's just retaliation with, there were so many factions in that, not just the two people who were fighting each other. And then of course, it's not a spoiler since this is already aired. And then the finale of ending in the cement, possibly for life. It was complicated. And I was going to say it took a whole day, took nearly an entire day. We had to film one other scene that night, but it was a full day's work and possibly the hardest thing we had over those two episodes. And heads off to Danny who is the stunt coordinator on the show for the brilliant fight he conceived. It sometimes says, they fight. (laughs) (laughs) Or they chase and there's a crash. And the extra that he always brings, in collaboration with the director suggesting things, a stunt coordinator will provide a director with a pre-visualization, which is kind of like a short film they make of the rehearsal with the stunt people. And once that gets approved, then you send the stunt people who are actually going to do it, some of which are the same who did the previs, but then start rehearsing the actors as well so that they're practiced as well. It's a quite long, arduous, complicated process that takes a lot of practice and creativity in terms of telling a story through action. And Danny, who is amazing, as is Johnny Arthur, who I have on NCS New Orleans. So my hat's off to those people. It must be really great to see the finished result once you've spent all that time just trying to piece it together as you're filming and things. It is. And, you know, sometimes I don't see it, Craig, until it airs, especially if part of it involves visual effects. Because I hand in my cut of my episode with maybe some doctor visual effects but they're enhanced quite a bit during post-production after I have already handed in my cut. So it's exciting to see it all finished. You're absolutely right. And you just go, wow, this is great. And is there any other shows in that universe that you would like to direct or CW shows in general? I know you've done Legacies, which is another one. Yeah, which was a very complex, especially because since I did the first season finale, I would love to do Nancy Drew. Cool. Yeah, I've watched a couple of episodes there. I did quite enjoy it. I do too. And especially since I grew up reading all the books that they're based on. (laughs) I would love to do, if I had to pick one in that universe, it would be Nancy Drew. Hopefully you can get involved in the upcoming Powerpuff Girls TV show that's probably going to get picked up. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. Yeah. That's proper superhero action that would be as well. Yeah. As you've done before. So Yeah. So what's next for you in terms of projects that you can talk about that are coming out? I have four more episodes to do this season. 
Okay, cool. Finished about mid-July, but the next two are on a show called Sacrifice, which were based on a TV movie of the same name for BET Plus, which is BET's streaming service. And then I follow that with a Netflix series, which is going into its second season called Sweet Magnolias. So I'm rounding it out with a very, very glossy, rich world show, followed by a very, very sweet hometown character-based friendship about three women. So I'm excited, both of which have great writing. So I'm happy, happy, happy to be doing those next. Well, best of luck with all those projects and everything else that you have on the go. I really do hope it all pans out. And I look forward to seeing the remaining Black Lightning episodes that you've got over the course of the season. Obviously, I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the season and seeing how yeah. it all ends. So really best of luck with all that. I think you've done really well on the episodes that I've they've seen that you've directed so it's been great to talk to you about the process of making those so one last question i always give to people on the podcast and it's related to the world of superhero dumb so if you could have any power what would it be and why wow oh i'll tell you what popped in my head but i don't think it's the one i'd want being a mind reader but i don't think i'd want that i think it would (laughs) have too much responsibility you know what I'd love to fly. It's a popular one. I, I fantasized about flying in my dreams for so much of my childhood. So, yeah, I think I'd definitely like to fly. Cool. Yeah, it's a popular one for a good reason. Save your fortune on traveling expenses as well. <laughs> yeah. And also, have you watched, is it Superman and Lois? Yes. Love that oh, show. That's another one that, boy, I would jump at doing. Okay, well, listen, it has been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I truly, truly am indebted to you, but also to the fans that you serve who watch these shows because we wouldn't be on the air if not for them. My pleasure. And thank you for bringing the show to us. Thank you for making it such high quality and keeping it going in that way because we watch it because we like it and we watch it because it's good. And That's a testament to everybody that works on it. So really, thanks very much for making sure everything's of the highest standard possible. Thank you. It's been great having you on. As I said, good luck with the future. And if you ever want to come on again and talk about future stuff, you're more than welcome. Oh, thanks, Steve. Thank you very much. Okay. That was our interview with Mary Lou Belli. Once again, a massive thanks to her for giving up her time and we wish her all the best in the future. If you like what you heard here, then please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or any podcast app of your choosing. Apple users, please do leave us a star rating and a comment. If you want to talk to us about anything, then hit us up on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave us a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. As always, we hope you'll join us on the next Neil Before Pod.